Thank you, Brent, uh, for the invitation. And uh, I'm excited to share with you some of the some of the things we've been doing here at UCSD in the last uh, few years. Um, so the brain is an amazing machine that allows us to transform uh, incoming sensory information and form an appropriate percept, and that is used to guide appropriate behaviors. And when you think about this loop, you know, it might seem that this is a pretty uh, fixed or stable loop, but it is actually highly dynamic. And to me, actually, the, one of the most fascinating properties of the brain is its ability to change and learn from experience. Just as one example, it is the ability of the brain to change that allows this bear cub, this little one, to watch its mother gracefully hunt migrating salmon so that uh, the, bear it's, the cub itself might be able to do the same in the near future. So this uh, ability to learn is conserved across animal kingdom. And obviously, we humans rely heavily on the ability of our brains to change and learn from experience. Uh, I don't know why I got dim like that. There we go. OK, so then a central question in systems neuroscience, which uh, we are particularly interested in, is how the brain changes from experience to guide behaviors flexibly. Okay, so this is the question that my laboratory here at the Center for Neural Circuits and Behavior uh, is focused on. And just to remind you, the, uh, the, the tissue that we're working with and the process that we are working with, I'll remind you that uh, the brain consists of uh, a, a discrete unit called neurons. And the brain is a complex circuit of numerous neurons. In the case of the human brain, it, the human brain has 100 billion of them. So it's a very complex circuit consisting of individual components called neurons. And when you're learning, the activity of individual neurons is changing. And we would like to know what about the activity of individual neurons changes and what is the underlying mechanism for those changes. So those are the key questions that we are uh, after. And we tackle this question using a uh, really a central question that we, uh, central uh, technique that we use, which is similar to what was introduced in the earlier talk. Um, it's it's an in vivo imaging technique using a two photon microscopy. And we are among the pioneers to use this technique in awake mice that are performing or learning various behavioral tasks, okay? And why do we use mice? Because, uh, mainly because we can use invasive techniques that we cannot use in humans. So for example, this mouse has a head plate implanted on the skull with a small hole in the skull, which is sealed with a glass window. So the, the brain is sealed physically, but optically it is, it is accessible. And the mice can live like this for a very long time. They can tolerate this uh, implant for a long time. The other reason we use mice is because of the, uh, the rich uh, set of tools that we can use to really identify circuit mechanisms uh, underlying behavior and learning. And I'll introduce to you some of those tools that we use later on in the talk. All right, so one of the main imaging modalities that we use is functional imaging using things like genetically encoded calcium indicators, for example, GCAMP, which was again introduced earlier. And basically, these are engineered proteins that we can introduce to individual neurons. And these proteins are fluorescent, and the level of fluorescence changes based on the activity of neurons. So when the neurons are active, they become brighter. And here is an example of a field of many neurons that express a particular genetically encoded calcium indicator imaged through a window like this in a mouse that is head fixed under the microscope. And yeah, so this, is, this movie is uh, sped up by about eight folds, 
But hopefully you can see that uh, you know, we can achieve a very nice signal to noise ratio. And so every time you see a neuron flash or become brighter, that's when that neuron is becoming active. Yeah. This is with GCAM 5G. Um, yeah, we've been using GCAM 6F. That is about twofold better. Yeah. But so, so this actually genetically encoded calcium indicators. That's uh, that's uh, and the field that is, that is rapidly emerging, and almost every year a new sensor is is introduced by uh, several labs that are working on this very hard. And the signal to noise is uh, always increasing. This is one of the latest sensors that we are using. And a main technique, um, uh, excuse me, main advantage that this approach offers us for the study of learning is that this, this setup is uh, highly stable and we can image and record from a set of neurons one day and put the mouse back in the home cage and take them out the next day and very easily find the same set of neurons and record from the same set of neurons the next day and next day and so on for many days and weeks. So this technique allows us to see how the ensemble activity of an identified set of neurons changes during the course of learning. Okay. So I've been saying learning, that's rather uh, vague. So what kind of learning do we study? So one of the forms of learning that we are focused on is motor learning or motor skill learning. So from simple movements like uh, picking up a cup of coffee to the exquisite precision of professional sports players, the a feature common in many movements that you make is that those movements are learned through trial and error. It really shapes the way we move our body. But the circuit mechanisms underlying this form of learning is still rather vague. And this um, this part of my lab is driven really by a very talented graduate student, Andy Peters, as well as the postdoc, Simon Chen, uh, with help from a technician, Anna Kim. So uh, the work that I will share with you today was done mainly by these three people. Okay, so to study motor learning, we had to uh, uh, establish a motor learning paradigm um, that mice can perform, which might model uh, things like this that we do, okay? And to do that, we developed a lever press task, okay? So in this task, a mouse is head fixed under a microscope and a lever is presented in front of its left forelimb, okay, left forepaw. And what they have to learn is to wait for a sound cue and press the lever beyond the set threshold and once it crosses a threshold, it receives a reward. So the reward in this case is a drop of water. So we make them a little thirsty by restricting the amount of water they, can, they consume. So water is a highly motivating reward for, for these mice. And we've learned that they can learn this task quite effectively. And they can learn to move the lever in response to the sound cue. And when we look at the individual movements closely, so here these gray lines represent the movements of the lever on individual trials on the first day of learning, okay? And hopefully you can see that every movement across trials is quite variable from trial to trial, okay? They do different things to get water. But as they perform and learn this task, about 100 trials each day for two weeks, at the end of the two weeks, they start developing this stereotyped movement that is conserved from trial to trial. Okay? They, do, they make this, uh, very similar movements from trial to trial. So this really is a hallmark, uh, this stereotypy of movements is really a hallmark of motor skill learning. It's quantified here. If you take the correlation of individual movements, you see that it's uh, monotonically increasing until it forms a stable uh, uh, motor pattern at, at the end of the two weeks of learning. So this is the, the learning that we will discuss today. And which part of the brain is important? To ask that question, we performed a lesion experiment. We, um, 
suspected that the part of the brain called the motor cortex is important. So we uh, did a quite simple experiment in which we lesioned or sucked up the motor cortex and let them recover from, from the surgery and see how they learn this task. Okay. And among the various behavioral measures, we found that the correlation of movements are much lower for the lesioned animals compared to control animals. So in other words, the lesioned animals do not develop this stereotyped movement. So they still perform the task, but their movements never stereotyped. So this, this and other experiments show that the motor cortex is absolutely required for the learning of this task. So we decided to look at the plasticity mechanisms within the motor cortex underlying this learning. Okay? To ask how the ensemble activity of motor cortex changes with this learning, we, did, uh, we performed in vivo two-photon calcium imaging. And we used a genetic tool available in mice which allows us to identify different neuron types. Okay? So in this particular transgenic mouse line, um, every inhibitory neuron, so the neurons that inhibit other neurons, expresses a red fluorescent protein called TD tomato. So the red neurons are inhibitory, and non-red neurons, or the green neurons, are excitatory neurons. So we can tease apart different cell types with this technique. About 20% of the motor cortex neurons turn out to be inhibitory, and about 80% are excitatory, and we can record activity from both of these types very nicely. Okay. And I'll show you the kind of activity that we study. So here's a video um, of the neuronal activity that is taken from a mouse that's performing this task. And at the bottom, what you see is the movement of the lever, the, the lever movement by the mouse. And what I'd like you to notice is that every time the mouse moves the lever, you see a lot of activity in the motor cortex, and there's very little activity between movements. So uh, this is the kind of mov movement-related activity that we study. And we can extract the activity traces for individual neurons. So these are about 80 um, movement-related excitatory neurons simultaneously recorded. And this is about 40 of them, 40 of inhibitory neurons that are movement-related. And you see that many, many neurons are coincidentally active every time the mouse moves the lever. And the question we're asking is, so we are recording from the same set of neurons throughout the course of learning of over two weeks, and how this changes with learning. That's, a, that's really a question um, we're addressing here. Yeah. Question. I see that the average trace in the inhibitor neurons is similar to knowledge nature and can increase, right? There is a sharper and higher active peaks so those kind of huge ones. However, it's not true with the excited neurons. Is it the jitter in the timing? Or what was it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let's see. So I think there are several factors. So the, the fraction of movement-related neurons is higher in inhibitory neurons than excitatory neurons. So the, in excitatory neurons, there are many neurons that are not movement-related. So that contaminates the average trace. But uh, the actually averaging helps in the case of inhibitory neurons. Yeah, good question. Any other questions so far? Okay. All right, so here's an example of three excitatory neurons that are recorded throughout learning. And from session one to session, in this case, 13. And what you see is this is movement, uh, movement average activity. So what you see is that this neuron was highly active during movements at the beginning of learning but it stopped being involved during movement uh, in later sessions. This neuron, in contrast, was only transiently active in session three, but was never active in other sessions. This third neuron became active starting at around session five and remained active throughout. 
these are just examples that even when the mouse is moving the, uh, doing very similar behaviors, is moving the lever for two weeks, the neurons that are involved dur uh, during that behavior is highly dynamic, the, and they, the identity of those neurons changes uh, throughout learning. As a population, we find that the excitatory neurons are much more dynamic than inhibitory neurons. So what, we, what this shows is that, on average, if an inhibitory neuron is movement-related, they, they ten, tend to be always movement-related. But excitatory neurons tend to come and go. So sometimes they're movement-related, sometimes they're not, like these neurons, okay, on average. And Inhibitory neuron activity is so more uh, stable, and what we think it does is to generally uh, balance the activity of excitatory neurons. So when we look at the amount of activity for inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons on trial by trial basis, we see a very nice linear correlation. So the more excitatory neurons are active on the given trial, the more inhibitory neurons are active as well, and vice versa. So Inhibitory neurons seem to generally balance the activity of excitatory neurons, and excitatory neurons are more dynamic. So we decided to focus on the changes of excitatory neurons throughout learning. When we look at the fraction of, or the number of neurons that are move, of excitatory neurons that are movement related, we find that there's an initial increase in the first few sessions of learning, and then this comes back to baseline, now it comes back down to the original, close to the original level. As if the system is exploring many, uh, many neurons at the initial phase of learning, you know? So the, the system is perhaps exploring different possibilities using different neurons until it, it picks a favorite pattern which is uh, refined over time in the last sessions of learning. And the result of this is that it develops a more or less stable uh, group of neurons that is dedicated, that are dedicated to this behavior. So the system seems to explore different patterns and then uh, over time refines and stabilizes to a stable uh, pattern uh, of neurons. Yes. Uh, if you prolong the experience time to like uh, three weeks, do you think um, if they will go back to the baseline, it will still higher, it will be higher than the baseline? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we don't know. So clearly, uh, we didn't do this experiment until it completely stabilizes, right? Um, so for that, I need to uh, refer you to previous work, uh, in things like human imaging experiments, in which they compared uh, uh, experts, okay, like uh, violinists or pianists uh, with uh, normal people. And generally, they find much less activity in experts, in the brain of experts, uh, compared to uh, naive people. So there was recently a paper that compared the, the motor cortex activity between uh, naive, a naive person and Neymar, okay, uh, the, in Brazil, the football player, soccer player. And they found that the Neymar used uh, much less activity of the motor cortex to move, its, move his foot. So that might tell you a little bit about how much this might go down over time. Yeah. But that's clearly uh, uh, learning over many years. Yeah, so that's a good question. Okay, so this is just the identity of neurons that we're looking at, but we have more information and when we look at the activity timing of individual neurons, we see something interesting. So here is uh, movement-related excitatory neurons from one animal, color-coded, so different colors correspond to different neurons, that is ranked or sorted based on the preferred time during a movement. So this is the movement onset. And it's a little messy, but what you should see is that every neuron is quite variable in terms of the activity timing from trial to trial. So for example, if this uh, green neuron, if you take this green neuron, it is active in some trials even before the movement onset and some trials a few seconds after the movement onset. So there's 
this neuron is active at different time across different trials. However, this seems to get more refined over time with learning until each neuron picks a more or less favorite time during which they are active. So as a population, this forms a nice sequence of activity, for, uh, starting from this blue neuron that is active at the onset of movement, which is followed with a slight lag by a green neuron, followed by the red neuron, and so on. So this forms a, a spatial-temporal sequence of activity that is reproducible from trial to trial that is paired with the learned activity, okay? So it's a stable sequence of activity emerges during motor learning. All right, so I'll just summarize what I have told you so far in a cartoon. So I told you that in the naive condition, the motor cortex activity is quite variable from trial to trial, and also the movement itself that is produced is variable from trial to trial at the beginning of learning, right? So in one trial, you might have activity pattern one, which is paired with the motor pattern or movement pattern one. And the next trial, you would see a different pairing, A2 paired with M2 and so on. Every trial, they have a different pattern. But with learning, this uh, stabilizes so that you see a more or less reproducible activity pattern. Now let's call it activity, activity pattern of experts, AE that is paired with the movement patterns of expert. Okay. And then the question that we really wanted to ask is, you know, is this just simply one of these, right? So you might think of a simple scenario in which during learning, the mouse simply decides to like a particular movement pattern, let's say M2, and then what happens uh, when they're experts is to just reproduce that pairing of activity A2 to M2. Okay. Or it's also possible that uh, there are some changes in the circuit during learning so that it creates an activity pattern that is not really seen uh, before learning. So this is a question we wanted to ask. So if the first, uh, first, uh, if the first scenario is true, then we would expect that if we look at movements made early on in learning that is similar to this expert movement, then the activity pattern paired with that movement should be very similar to the expert activity pattern. So this is the analysis we performed here. So we defined the learned activity pattern, okay, nice and reproducible uh, press of the lever, and the activity pattern during those trials was a nice sequence of activity of a bunch of neurons. And we took trials from uh, towards the end of learning and sorted them based on how similar the movement of the trial is to the learned pattern. And even after learning, in some trials, they make movements that are very different from this learned pattern. And we can sort them accordingly from trials in which the movement was very similar to the learned pattern to the trials in which the movements were very dissimilar. What do the activity patterns look like in these trials? Well, we find a very nice relationship between the similarity of movements to the learned pattern and the similarity of activity to the learned pattern. So that the more similar the movement is to the learned pattern, the more similar the activity is to the learned pattern as well. This may not be very surprising. You know, the more similar the movement is to the learned pattern, the activity is also similar. But what uh, really in intrigues us is that when we do the same analysis using the trials from the same animals but before learning, we don't see this relationship at all. The most interesting data points are here, okay? So this learned pattern of activity is consistently observed when the mouse, after learning, makes the learned movement. But very similar movements made by the same animal, but before learning, involves a very different activity pattern, okay? So this really suggests to us that this learned activity pattern is really learned during learning, 
perhaps before learning, they can't really make the activity pattern, and something about the circuit changes, so that allows us, uh, allows the animals to make this and reproduce this activity pattern. Okay. So here's a cartoon version of it. So another implication of this uh, study is that there are many different motor cortex activity patterns that can lead to a particular movement. And in fact, initially during learning, different activity patterns are explored that are, that each of which can be led to a particular movement pattern. But what happens during learning is that something about the circuit changes which allows the system to reproduce one particular pattern. And after learning this uh, uh, stable pairing of this reproducible activity pattern and the reproducible movement pattern emerges as a result of learning. Okay. And all right, so this is, um, you know, we were pretty happy with this description of the changes in the activity pattern within the motor cortex. And yeah, go ahead. So, so when we trace the time progression and progression, consolidation of the movement in this stereotypical shape mm -hmm. and consolidation of the normal activity in this stereotypical sequence, is it possible to see what happens first? Is it the movement that first that some other system outside of the normal cortex? And then the motor system learns to reproduce this particular stereotypical movement where it is possible? Or it's vice versa? I do, yeah, that's a great question. Um, sure, so the question is, you know, which happens first? So I told you that the uh, movement improves and also the activity pattern in the motor cortex uh, becomes more reproducible and during learning. The question is which happens first, right? Um, yeah, I don't think we have a good answer to that yet. So. We assume that you know the changes here is are really driving the changes in the movement pattern, but we don't have good evidence for that. I don't think. Yeah, it's possible that another part of the brain is learning this and that's transferring here, for example. However, if you do the reverse, right? Yeah. If you take the primary motor cortex, the, the regular performance is graded. However, the learning seems to be unfair. Yeah, okay, so um, I think that's, I hope we have time. The second part of my talk uh, partially addresses that question. So we have some manipulation in the motor cortex that affects learning. So uh, that partially addresses your question. So yeah, stay tuned. It's a great question. So uh, the next part of my talk uh, has to do with the mechanism underlying this, so which you know, relates to the question that was just asked. So all right, the activity patterns change here, but how does it happen? That's really the question we're after. And generally, uh, we believe that learning happens by changes in synapses, right? Uh, all, all of us know what synapses are. That's the connections between two neurons uh, where the information transfer occurs from presynaptic to postsynaptic neurons. And we can use a very similar imaging approach to actually look at the changes in synapses, okay, in this part of the brain. So if we express fluorescent proteins in a given, in a sparse set of neurons and look at the, the dendrites of that neuron, we can see these uh, protrusions out of these neurons which correspond to these postsynaptic sites of an excitatory synapse. So these are called dendritic spines, these protrusions. These are post, main postsynaptic sites of excitatory synapses. And we can see like this, so here's a uh, sparsely labeled motor cortex neurons imaged at the uh, apical uh, part close to the surface of the brain. And hopefully you can see some of those uh, uh, thick branches, so those are dendrites, okay, with some protrusions coming out of that. So these thick uh, length, those are dendrites, and then the protrusions coming out of them are dendritic spines, so like this. So this is one dendritic spine, this is one dendritic spine, and so on. So these are the synapses, and we can identify and follow the same synapses throughout the course of learning. 
And so we did this during the same learning of the two weeks of this motor skill. And we see a lot of changes in the motor cortex that, um, that coincide with the changes in the activity as well as the movement pattern. So for example, this uh, spine uh, is a spine that formed during learning, so it wasn't there. It didn't exist at the beginning of learning, but this dendritic branch uh, grew a new spine, so that's a new synapse that this neuron is receiving. And also, this synapse that was there at the beginning of learning got eliminated, so it disappeared after a few sessions of learning. So there is a turnover of excitatory synapses onto these neurons in the motor cortex. And as a population, you see something like this. So there's an, uh, a large amount of additions of synapses at the beginning of learning, which is followed by the elimination of some of the old spines like this in such a way that there is an increase in the density of synapses in the beginning phase of learning, which, is, uh, which comes back to the baseline one over the course of learning. So this shows that the uh, synapses within the motor cortex turns over, a uh, turnover uh, during learning. In the cartoon version, it looks like this. So you start with a set of, set of synapses and at the beginning phase of learning, you get new synapses in a learning-related way, which is then uh, followed by elimination of some of these old spines so that the total density goes back to the baseline, but there's a, there's a new set of synapses during learning. And our working hypothesis now is that these new synapses that form in a learning-related way is really essential for the reproduction of this particular activity pattern that's paired with this um, reproducible uh, movement. Okay, um, and we have a little more evidence for that, that, uh, that uh, model based on the last few slides that I will show you. So, all right, so synapses turnover in a learning related way. And we wanted to know how this is regulated so that we might be able to begin to manipulate this process, okay? And to that, we turned to a, a diverse set of neurons in the cortex uh, that inhibit other neurons, so inhibitory neurons, consist of many different subtypes that, pro, uh, that inhibit different compartments of, the, of excitatory neurons. And, uh, New, new tools, genetic tools, are becoming available to study different subtypes of inhibitory neurons in mice, and we focus. Uh, and it is known that the synaptic plasticity or excitatory synaptic plasticity is under the control of inhibitory neurons. So we wanted to know how inhibitory neurons are changing during this process. And to do that, we focused on two major types of inhibitory neurons identified by uh, marker expression somatostatin-expressing neurons, and parvalbumin-expressing neurons. I'll just refer to them as SOM and PV. And this consists of about, composes about uh, a half of inhibitory neurons in the cortex. And we did similar experiments to the spine imaging, in which we expressed GFP in sparse set of SOM or PV neurons. And we can look at the axons and count the number of these boutons, or varicosities, which correspond to the presynaptic terminals. If we go back to this image, if you focus not on those thick branches, but on thin branches, so those thin branches are axons, okay? And hopefully you can see, for example, all right, it'll be hard for me to point out, but uh, I hope you can identify some of the thin branches and you can see little uh, varicosities along the length of those thin axons. Uh, it might be easier to see in this static image. So this, along this length of axon, these little uh, varicosities correspond to the synapses these inhibitory neurons make, okay? And so we follow the dynamics of these synapses during learning. And here's an example of one axon in, of some neurons uh, imaged through, throughout learning. And we found that uh, these boutons or synapses that this neuron was making at the beginning 
was eliminated rapidly in the first phase of learning. And here's the population data. So there's a massive reduction in the number of synapses or inhibitory synapses made by some neurons. Okay? And this, um, I will tell you in a little bit what this might mean. So bear with me. And when we did the same experiment with the other inhibitory neuron type, PV neurons, we see something quite different. So here's an axon image throughout learning. And you see that this axon acquired a new synapse during learning. So it, uh, after learning, there is a synapse that was not there at the beginning. Here's the uh, population data. So there's a rapid increase in the uh, number of synapses made by PV neurons in the learning-related way. Okay. So what could this mean? What I haven't told you is that some neurons and PV neurons inhibit different compartments of the excitatory neurons. And some neurons inhibit the distal dendrites. So this is the part where we see new synapses form during learning in a learning-related way. And PV neurons inhibit the perisomatic region. Okay? And what we, st what we see is that there's less inhibition, fewer inhibitory synapses on the distal dendrites and an increase of inhibition onto the perisomatic region. And this turns out to be specific to learning and not just to the uh, performance of this task. So what we did was to train a set of mice for two weeks, like we always do, and left the mice for one month and then trained them with the same task again one month later. And behaviorally, they remember this uh, motor skill very well. So after one month of a break, their performance, as well as, as the movement pattern, are conserved okay, cons uh, for one month. And when they perform this uh, previously learned task after one month, we do not see these synaptic changes, okay? So these synaptic changes are specific to the initial phase of learning. And here's our model. So at the beginning of learning, the balance of inhibition shifts, and there's less inhibition in dendrites, more inhibition in soma, which we presume to create a condition in which the dendrites become hyperactive or more active, and I won't go into the details, but there's a lot of study, um, uh, previous studies that show that synaptic uh, plasticity requires uh, this activation of dendrites. So this might create a condition in which the dendrites become more plastic, okay? And that might create a condition in which the system can create new synapses to encode this new memory, okay? So it's as if, as if the inhibitory neurons are saying, all right, uh, now is the time to be plastic. Now is the time for you to learn a new motor skill. So be plastic right now, okay? That's our model. And if this model is really correct, then you might imagine that if we interfered with this uh, process, perhaps by uh, driving this uh, some neurons uh, stronger than usually, uh, using a, a tool called uh, a technique called optogenetics, then we might be able to interfere with this process and block the plasticity of synapses as well as learning. So this is the experiment we did, and we were very happy to see that that was uh, what we saw. So we expressed a, a, a light-sensitive cation channels. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to you. Uh, how many of you know optogenetics? Good, uh, about half. So this is a recently developed technique in the last 10 years or so, which, al uh, which allows us to use light to control the activity of a specific set of neurons, okay? And we um, expressed a protein called channel rhodopsin only in the some cells so that we can act, uh, activate some cells just using light. And so we activated this, uh, these some cells during learning and we indeed blocked the increase of spines that were seen usually in the control animals, but when some cells are activated, this uh, increase was blocked. And this is mainly driven 
by the destabilization of newly formed spines. So when some cells are becoming active, the spines that form in a learning-related way did not persist for a long time, but got eliminated very quickly. And if we think that this uh, formation of new spines and the stabilization of new spines uh, is important for learning, you might e expect that this interferes with learning. And indeed, that's what we saw. So in the same mice, when we look at the movements throughout learning, we saw that the movements never stereotyped, just like when the motor cortex was lesioned. So compared to the control animals, which developed the stereotyped movements that are correlated from trial to trial, the um, mice in which some cells were activated uh, did not develop that stereotypy. So this, uh, we think this is really uh, good uh, suggestive evidence that the synaptic plasticity here within the motor cortex is really crucial for the encoding of this new motor skill. And there was a question in the back. Yeah, so specifically, how did you express channel adoption in some cells and not the other cell type? Yeah, so that is uh, something that is possible uh, in only in mice and a few species. Uh, so the new tool that is available, you know, a transgenic mouse line, that expresses a recombinase called Cre, and we would inject a viral vector that is only expressed when the cell has this recombinase. Okay, so so that's that's a, a fairly common way that's used recently to restrict the expression of proteins to specific cell types. So some cells have a known genetic marker that allows you to make Cre. Exactly. So actually, some cells are named after the marker somatostatin. So yeah, so the Cree recombinase was uh, knocked into the endogenous locus of somatostatin. Yeah, good question. Okay, and we think, we think this uh, manipulation is specific because when we, um, after this manipulation, if we stop the light, uh, light activation of some cells, the mouse can then learn this task. But, and when we activate the some cells after learning, we really don't see a deterioration of the movement, okay? So the SOMA activation impairs movements only during learning, and it does not affect the movements after learning, okay? So let me summarize what I just told you. So it appears that this reorganization of inhibitory circuits really open the window of plasticity, so they really tell the excitatory neurons to be plastic, okay? And that process is essential for the excitatory neurons to encode and receive new synapses that are formed in a learning-related way. And these synapses perhaps encode the memory of this motor skill that is uh, required for the uh, reproducible activity pattern as well as the reproducible movement pattern. And I'll uh, uh, go in a little, uh, speculate a little more to, to tell you what we mean by that. We haven't really proven this, but the model that we have is that this kind of circuit plasticity creates a circuit within the motor cortex that is required for the reproduction of a particular activity pattern. So let's say you have uh, three neurons that should be active at the beginning of movement, and perhaps the connections among themselves increase using these new spines and so that uh, they can be fun uh, active together. And also, this would require another set of synapses that in which these blue neurons can drive the next set of neurons, these green neurons, and this kind of circuit plasticity might be able to encode this kind of synaptic chain within the motor cortex in which a uh, set of neurons drives the next set of neurons which drives the next set of neurons and so on. And this could underlie this stereotyped sequence of movements that's paired with the movement. And then this stereotyped sequence of movements is, uh, is an efficient pattern to drive this learned movement. And that's perhaps why uh, one can reproduce after skill learning a particular motor skill uh, in a perhaps an effortless way because the circuit itself is set up to produce this particular activity pattern. So, um, you perhaps don't need 
to uh, exert a lot of conscious effort to make a, make a learned movement. So that might be involved in what you see in the Neymar's brain, right? Um, in which he can move his foot with very little effort and very little activity in the brain. So this is a model. Uh, we haven't proven this, but we're uh, trying to come up with experiments to test some of the predictions of the model right now. Yeah. Um, did you see any spatial pattern? Because we can see very nice temporal pattern synchronization, but did you see any, for example, certain pairs of neurons which is oriented a certain, I mean, this align certain orientation has a more strong correlation, something, those kind of special pattern, did you? Uh, let, let's see, if I understood your question correctly, so are neurons that, are, that fire at about the same time, are they spatially clustered? Is that your question? Some pairs, which has strong correlation, is uh, aligned with a certain, certain direction or a certain... Oh, I see. But, so, so basically, any spatial structure that would predict uh, the timing of activity. So we haven't found that. We haven't found that. We've looked. We wondered if these neurons are spatially clustered or if there's any spatial patterning, and we haven't found that. And that doesn't mean that they don't exist. But yeah, we haven't found that. Yeah, so, so, it's so good candidate for this intermediate Right, so um, yeah, the question is, you know, how, all right, so we, we think we identified a potential mechanism for, uh, for controlling the excitatory neuron plasticity. So that's the changes in the inhibitory circuit. What is driving this change? So that's, that's really the question. And we've been thinking about that a lot. Um, we don't know, but we have some ideas. So one thing I can tell you is that the order of changes seems to be that the changes in some cells precede the changes in spines as well as changes in PV cells, okay? So that seems to in, uh, exclude the possibility that PV cells are telling some cells to decrease. And I think there are several possibilities uh, remaining. Uh, one is that, you know, well, this is hand-waving, but <laughs> speculation. One possibility is that something about neuromodulators like dopamine, okay, uh, which uh, are known to be released and required for motor learning, could signal uh, specifically to inhibitory neurons and tell them to change the synaptic weights. And another possibility that we like is that these excitatory neurons are, can actually do some retrograde signaling using BDNF or things like that that would specifically tell some cells to reduce the number of synapses. Um, these are some of the mechanisms that we're thinking about how to test. Okay, yeah, good question. Yeah. I was wondering, those new form the uh, synapse, were they, will they uh, remain there always, or uh, some uh, later on they will get eliminated? Right, yeah, uh, good question. So, uh, all right, uh, we haven't done that experiment, so we haven't followed the same uh, spines for more than two weeks. So, what I can tell you is that for the duration of two weeks, most of the spine synapses that form during learning remain, okay? And there's a, another group that did a similar work, but a similar study during learning, but over a long period of time, over months. And they showed that those learning-related, uh, spines that formed in a learning-related way tended to remain more than other spines, but 
uh, not all of them. So there's still elimination of some of these learned spines, learned uh, formed spines, but some of them remain, some of them get eliminated. Yeah. So perhaps you become you know, more efficient and you remove some of the synapses that you don't really need and only focus on what's really important. So that's kind of a, an interpretation. Yeah. yeah. What if they learn new tasks for new human? Is there a chance? Yeah, so I only showed you about one uh, task, and the question is what happens if they learn another task? And we haven't done that. Uh, other groups have done that. And other groups have shown that uh, a learning of a new task uh, tended to correlate with the same process, so the elimination of uh, old spines and the formation of new spines. So in addition to these spines that form in the wave coinciding with the learning of a task, in addition, there's another set of spines that form that coincide with the learning of this new task. The question here is that these new purple spines will be remained even after learn new That's task, right. or there, there's a chance these new spines also could be removed as well. This kind of question. So these uh, learning-related spines tend to remain more than other spines, but sometimes they get eliminated. And learning of a second task does not seem to affect the dynamics of these uh, spines associated with this particular uh, task. But it's still possible that if you keep learning new tasks, then you know, maybe when you learn the 10th task, maybe that starts to interfere with the first task that you learn by um, interfering with the dynamics of those original spines. But that has not been tested. So it, it's, it, which relates to the interesting question of what's the capacity of the system. Uh, it hasn't been rigorously tested. Yeah. I'll, I'll, let me just show you the last slide, which is an uh, acknowledgement slide. So this is uh, uh, my group uh, here at UCSD. And I talked today about uh, the work by Andy, Simon, and Anna. And uh, um, yeah, thanks to the, the funding agencies. And thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take more questions if there's any. What are the time scales and the spatial scales of the calcium uh, sensors or the calcium imaging, let's say, sensing um, workflow? Okay, so, so there are uh, several factors. Um, so the cal calcium sensor itself has a pretty rapid onset. So following a burst of spikes, the, they become brighter within a couple tens of milliseconds, okay? with a, a decay which is slower over the course of hundreds of milliseconds, okay? So what we do when we analyze is to just focus on the initial rise phase. So that really tells you when the cells are spiking, uh, firing action potentials, and the re rest is just a decay. Uh, there's another factor which uh, relates to how fast we can image, and that there's a, a trade-off between you know, how many neurons and how big of a field we want to image. And, and how fast we want to image. The, the more we focus, the faster we can image. What we tend normally do is to image at about 30 hertz, which is uh, pretty fast, actually, for this, and which encompasses about 500 microns by 500 microns, including a couple hundred neurons. That's, that's kind of the time scale. Okay. Any additional questions? Yeah, I'm just wondering, does the formation of new spine and the elimination of some of them, do you think it implied that these cells are connecting to other neurons they weren't connected to before, or just connecting in a different way to ones they've already been connected to? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and we don't know. We don't know. Uh, yeah, there, that would be very hard to test. Um, we're very interested in that, so yeah. But yeah, we don't know. There are po several possible ways to get at that question, but it would be very hard. Yeah. So yeah. that the, some sudden uh, rest fly you show is the spikes or just high? I mean, did you recover the spikes from this slow calcium imaging or? I see. Uh, n no, we did not. So we so those raster plots correspond to what we call calcium events, and we. We, we expect that we can 
each event corresponds to about three spikes or more. Okay, we're probably missing single spikes. But, but we, know, we know from recording that our uh, temporal resolution is very good. So when we, say, when we say there's an event, there's definitely a burst of spikes within uh, two, 20 milliseconds. So our temporal resolution is very good. All right, thank, thank you very, very much. much.